There we go. Recording in progress. You're all going to be stars. Um, so uh, let's see here. You know, I'll get started with my introduction, which nobody probably wants to listen to anyway, and then we'll get on to you, BG. It's, it's um, deeply flattering for me, though, so I always love to listen to it. Okay. Well, um, I want to welcome everybody to Peter White Public Library. Um, my name is Marty Ackett, and I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator for Peter White. And tonight, it is my privilege to introduce and welcome B.G. Bradley back to Authors Reading Virtually, this time to read from his soon-to-be-released edition to his Hunter Lake series, um, this time the collection of novellas titled Old Hunter. And if you're doing the math, um, that means that B.G. has had two books come out in less than four months, and that's almost a Stephen King-like a statistic. So um, that's pretty amazing. Um, I've known BG for over 25 years. First as a fellow student in the master's writing program at Northern Michigan University, and now um, as a writing buddy and one of my best friends. And let me tell you, he never ceases to amaze me with his artistic output and talent, especially since retiring from teaching high school English. Um, Beach does everything, novels, uh, short stories, plays, poetry, acting, directing. Um, Google the term Renaissance man, and it wouldn't surprise me if there was a picture of BG there, probably holding a fishing pole, a hunting rifle, or um, a slobbery smiling dog. One of, the, one of those things, that's what he's going to be holding. Um, one of my favorite BG Bradley stories happened at the Joy Center. Um, in Ishpeming. It was the night of the monthly open mic that's held there called Out Loud. And before we started reading and sharing that night, Beach told me how he'd been struggling with his poetry uh, writing recently. Um, instead of writing long, flowing, beautiful, graceful lines, um, Beach could only manage short, disjointed fragments or images or aphorisms. Um, and he wasn't mad about it. You know, I um, mean, he was simply sort of flummoxed with what was going on in his creative mind. Uh, so when Beach got up for his turn at, at the open mic, um, he started reading these poetry fragments and they were like, um, they were sort of like tiny shotgun blasts of words. I guess that's the best way to describe them. And, um, and after about 30 or 40 seconds, our friend Helen, who is, who is here tonight, started to giggle and and sort of choke back laughter and as he continued to read. And then I started to follow sort of Helen's example that night. And as Beach read on, and Beach read on. And um, by the time he was done with his turn, um, Beach, uh, uh, Helen and I were so red faced and sore from trying to hold in our laughter. And um, uh, all that um, Beach did with us was he sort of looked at us and nodded after he was done. And, I, I think you may have laughed too. And then, then you said this, I know, I have no idea what the hell is going on in my head. I mean, that is the exact quote that I remember. And, um, and all three of us sort of melted into laughter again. But, you know, here's the thing. Beej is a writer that, who simply trusts the process of writing. Um, he knew that night at the Joy Center that um, what he was sharing wasn't really poetry or prose. Um, and he probably thought it wasn't even that good, which, which was mistaken, but, but it didn't matter. For him, writing is a journey, an opportunity to discover new things about himself and the world around him. Whether writing fragments of poems or fiction or nonfiction or plays or whatever, Beach just knows that whatever he is working on will guide him to safe shores eventually. And only a true writer has that kind of trust in the creative process. And Beach is a writer's writer. Um, he taught high school English for around 30 years at, Wester at um, Westwood High School. Um, he's been a newspaper reporter, columnist, part-time college professor, and what he is still is a poet, novelist, playwright, director, actor, and just the very best friend you could ever want. 
Um, his, his fiction, nonfiction, and poetry appeared in various regional publications, including Detroit Sunday Magazine, Michigan Out of Doors, Passages North, Sidewalks, Fox Cry Review, the Marquette Mining Journal, and the Newberry News. And Old Hunter, the book that he's going to be reading from tonight, is the fifth book in his Hunter Lake series. Um, his other Hunter Lake novels include Winter Heart, Summer Rounds, Fall Back, and Tales from the Sugar Shack. Um, and they're all really wonderful. And um, I really encourage everybody to pick those up and read them. But um, please join me in welcoming to Peter White Public Library tonight, my really, really good, good friend, writer B.G. Bradley. Well, Marty, thank you so much. That's so much more than I deserve. And you make me sound so much more with it than I really am um, and when in terms of writing. But the one thing that was very definitely absolutely the truth about this story is I really didn't know what the hell was going on in my head. And it did work out, thank God. Um, but but uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Marty. And I do, you'll be happy to know that I do have two slobbery dogs in the room with me as we speak. And they are in the room with me because if they were anywhere else, they would hear voices and they'd be barking right now. So I, I've kept them close here. So I'm gonna try to read um, uh, a chapter each from three of the four novellas. The first of the four novellas that's in Old Hunter is called Season's End. And I'm not uh, exaggerating when I say that if I was to read so much of us as a sentence from it, for people who have read the other books so far, it would just give away too much. Um, and with, there's some surprises in the book and they start with the very first page and it would just give away too much. So I'm gonna stay away from that other than to just tell you that it is uh, a story, uh, the speaker in the story is, is, um, uh, is Carrie Sylvanus, Dale's wife, um, and, and, and she is the main figure in the story. Um, so I'm gonna jump right from there to the, uh, the titular, um, uh, novella of the four, which is Old Hunter. Um, and this is basically the history of the community and surrounding area of Hunter, fictional, of course, um, from 1832, I think, um, to the present day. Um, and I'm going to start uh, in 1895. And I think the rest will be pretty uh, self-explanatory. From there, I will then go on and read, if there's time, I will read from um, Reflections, which is set in contemporary times in Hunter, and from a young Hunter, which is uh, also set in contemporary times. Anyway, this uh, first chapter from, from the novella, Old Hunter, um, is called Canoe Trip. Long ago, my oldest friend Arthur and I devised a rule that we now hold to hard and fast. From the time we arrive at our fishing cabin, until the sun has truly risen and Helios has driven it well up, we do not speak. One forgets after a time how such things begin, but it is our tradition and it is a good one. And so as we drop down the bank in this chilled half darkness in the birch bark canoe or Wigwasi Jiman, Shishipak construct for us, constructed for us long ago with his simple skilled hands, there is no sound but that of loons calling from the fog out on Benagama. It is a jest now, well beyond ancient, between Arthur and me that I am now the only one who calls this lake by its native name, which means Crystal Lake, but most now refer to it as Hunter Lake, and I have seen maps which give it the same moniker. I do not fight against it, and I am flattered and humbled that so many now choose to call this lake I love by that name. The name has become official since my grandson, Henry Hunter II, filed it in, in that way, filed it in that way at the Marquette Claims Office after his race with the grandson of Mr. Levesque, who lost the lake all those years ago in the chess game with Judge McDonald, to be the first to lay an official claim to both the lake and the surrounding town and the timber areas adjacent. Shishipak, if he still lives, was always amused and sometimes I sense appalled by our Euro European hubris and laying claim to what is clearly not ours, but belongs to the great and holy cosmos. 
but he never rose up in anger at us. And though he always said words of appreciation to both Arthur and me about our writings in support of the Ojibwa in this area and to the tribes of other names across this nation, he did say time and again with a sigh, things are as they are. And after the fighting is done, we must all learn from and adjust our lives to what comes. I confess to only barely comprehending this noble, if resigned sentiment. And I believe that if I were one of his people as my dear departed wife, my children and my grandchildren, and now my great grandchildren are, I might have risen up as so many of the Western Indians did and continue to do. Now though, that has largely ended in tragedy, atrocity and tears. And I come to the sad conclusion that Shishupak was quite right that despite my years of optimism about the eventual fate of man, we are doomed at least for another, perhaps a millennia yet, to come into conf conflict with our fellows, resulting in this painful and inevitable subjugation, death, and destruction. These thoughts, thoughts seem too grim as we lay our paddles to the water and start east towards the glowing through the fog. It was warm this morning in the fish cabin, Arthur and I built with Shishupak's help those many years ago, and I somewhat regretted leaving its confines for the cold air. It remains the only dwelling on this lake of any kind except the Levesque summer house around in the bay to the west. Henry II convinced his father to sell the bay, to sell the, the bay end for a very nominal fee of one dollar after their great race to the claims office to Pierre Levesque, who humbly took his consolation prize. Henry II's uh, thinking was that we have always tried to take the higher road represented by the golden rule and that our ultimate, for lack of a better term, victory over the Levesque family should be punctuated with grace. There has been talk in that family for a great while of the developments they will bring to the bay, but so far I thank the stars and the good Lord who guides them, none have taken hold. And despite their best efforts, the teeming crowds have not shown up to spend their leisure time on these waters. And this little gem of the North remains unmolested and little known as does so much of this great peninsula. Log logging operations made possible by the innovation of rail are now in force just to the east. And on some sad days, one can hear the trees falling and hear the narrow gauge rail cars moving their loads to the main tracks near the trout, near the trout lake on the road to St. Ignace. This saddens me, but this too is, as Shishipak always said, another circumstance of learning and adjustment. The year 1895 has come, and we are now well into it. Arthur and I have each reached and passed our 75th year, and still we live and time moves. What the next century will bring is certainly cause for speculation, but that too is out of our hands now. And who in any case could begin to imagine what is to come? any more than one could have imagined the great good fortune that a preposterous game of chess in a drawing room of an Ohio judge has brought us all here in these northern latitudes. We are better just to lay our hands to our paddles and enjoy this day. We had coffee, some eggs, a bit of the fry bread, my granddaughter, Bisanibi, fine water, made for us yesterday, and some rashers of bacon over our hearth this morning. It will keep the chill off, though my, old, though my old bones, I must confess, have seen better days. In weak moments, Arthur too confesses of a growing sense of strength ebbing away, c'est la vie. Now, as we move along the nearly invisible North Shore, I am quite simply happy to be with my friend in this wilderness we set out for uh, 50 years ago. Sometimes when I walk the streets of Hunter, there are over 20 streets now, I half believe I am dreaming. And it is not always a good dream. My son, the mayor is nearly always in battle over the future of our town with some new force come out from the cities to lay claim to the timber or the river or to simply slice off, slice off his own piece of the wilderness pie. I am of course a hypocrite to grudge anyone their dream of wilderness since I have certainly had mine fulfilled. What troubles me is that these new dreams of these new people to our land often seem to lack the civility that I like to think Arthur and I brought here, a civility that we saw echoed to our great fortune in the ideas of Shishupak who guided us, <laughs> or perhaps our civility was echoing his. In retrospect, I rather think that was the case. 
Without him, I wonder if we would be so different from, for instance, this so-called boss, Big Tom Whalen, who arrived here with his flowing cash and his tomahawk trade and transportation company seven years ago, bent on cutting all the trees our friend Kevin O'Mara and his enlightened successor, Seamus O'Brien, had not. And to make Hunter into his town and just part of the great holdings under his banner. If I have ever met a more loathsome and detestable man, I do not recall it. Suffice it to say that up to that time, I had been reluctantly convinced by Arthur that calling our town Hunter was not an act of hubris on my part, but an appeal to the romantic sensibilities of all who might settle here with its metaphorical reference to not only the game of the woods, but the eternal hunt for a better way of life. But once I understood that Wayland intended to buy me out, cut all the trees without replanting, and build an industrial roundhouse for his rail lines in the center of town and further, name the town a good old Indian name, Tomahawk, after that loathsome creation of white scalp hunters, though in his incomprehensible and abundant ignorance, I'm quite certain Mr. Whalen was not aware of this, I clung to and insisted that the town was and would always be Hunter. While we of the town, river, and lake, for the most part, banded together in that instance, though we have always been a bit of a band of brothers anyway in this locale, and held Boss Whalen off, though there were some voices raised in support of that insufferable man, and many who hold that the Hunter family and our close friends merely wanted all the profit for ourselves. I believe and pray that this is not true, and the evidence that it is, that it is not, lies in the very fact that had we taken Wayland's offer, Arthur and I and our families would be much richer now, though our forests would be completely laid flat, and no doubt fires as have struck so hard elsewhere in the area would have raised all that remained. No doubt we would have fallen victim to this fate even without Mr. Wayland's help, had Arthur and I not taken a journey with young Sean O'Brien to the west, where he showed us that the sceny forests have been cut and burned over until there remains nothing but a devastated plain covered with stripped and charred white pine stumps as far as the eye can see, the so-called stump graveyards. This, Mr. Rear O'Brien had shown us to convince us to help him fund his more conservative plan of repl replanting of native trees following the cuts. O'Brien and his kin, including my friend Arthur's wife, though at rare times righteously hot-tempered, are ultimately level-headed and right-thinking. But this, this is all dross this morning. The detritus of history, which we leave behind as we paddle further to the east out of time and into the fog. We move along a shore, which though I cannot see it, I know is covered with birches rising up a high ridge with a lovely view of Benagama's waters in spring, fall, and winter, and obscured by foliage in the summer. Spring brings wildflowers to that ridge and Shishipak has shown me a wolf's den just below it, covered around its sizable entry holes, which are in warm months marked by swarms of flies preying on the poor beasts within with vines and princess pine. Beyond that to the east lies Ginudawawanga or alternately Mitawanga, Long Sand Beach or Sandy Beach. I must confess to a preference for the Ojibwa names for the area, though in truth the native names are no more imaginative than those of our King's English. The roman romantic in me loves the trill of the tongue their pronunciation causes. I also enjoy my linguist friends Arthur's valiant but always ineffectual attempts at their pronunciation, which makes all the natives, including those in my family, laugh. Master of seven languages is Arthur, but Ojibwa always masters him. The water is high on Benagama this spring, and the channel that joins the body of the lake to the greater of the two muddy fingers, uh, which stretch east, is easily paddled without ne need of our leaving the canoe. For two old men, this is truly a blessing, and now we move into the magic realm where the fog is coming ever thicker. I had hoped for such a morning, and Providence has granted it to two old and no longer so hardy explorers. I can just make out Arthur's appreciative smile as we move into the dark and shallow waters of big mud. The lake is for practical purposes bottomless and no attempt to wait it goes without a disaster as we and many and as we and many know have found on, on many occasions. The depth of the silt below the water is unknown and we no longer test it. Onward to the east we move down along the Point Creek 
and along the cranberry swamp that has the appearance of land, but it's really only a joined congregation of roots that balance over water. Walking along it is akin to tra traversing an ill-made rope bridge over a chasm. One is never at ease. And indeed, it is quite easy to fall through into the nether regions of this lake. The natives tell many stories, both apocryphal and genuine, of ancestors who disappeared under such circumstances, never to be found. And then now the magic I had so hoped for. The sun begins to rise. I seem to hear Mr. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony echoing as it comes up through the fog to our east, first breaking into all the colors of the sun, breaking through water, prisms into each individually, so that Arthur and I find ourselves paddling through a rainbow. My heart is full. Okay, and that, that does it for the reading from that first chapter. I'm gonna move on now shortly here, as soon as I find it, um, to the next, uh, the next of these novellas, which is uh, uh, Reflections, which is set uh, in the present day. And I'm scrolling through here right now, trying to find it. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, now this uh, comes back to uh, the main character of the first book, uh, Winter Heart, um, to Ben O'Brien, and we we open up um, uh, with him. Um, and it's a summer morning in, in Hunter. And this, uh, uh, this chapter is called Crash. Ben O'Brien lay under his ancient bicycle on the pavement, halfway up a little hill on the Hunter Road. The air was cool. It was July. Yes, July 8th. Morning. Just a little way ahead was the rails to trails turnoff where he would have entered the crushed gravel road that was Clearwater Trail, which would have led him the rest of the way to the lake. Val had told him not to bike today, but that had been because the, his sinuses were acting up, not because she would thought he would crash. You're sick, she had said, please don't go. If I don't go, I'll clog up. This way I can blow it all out. Gross, yeah, but it works. Sinuses could bring on a whole world of confusion and disorientation for him. And she knew that, she knew him well. He had had just a faint inkling that she was sensing something else too. If she had phrased it differently and said, hey, I don't feel right about your biking today. Why don't you skip it? Or something like that, he might not have gone. Oh, who was he kidding? He definitely would have gone anyway because he was a stubborn old coot. The truth was though, that the pedal had broken because he was a fat ass. This had nothing to do with his sinuses or anything supernatural. The stress of all his weight, which was back up to 250 again after he'd gotten it down to 202 from a high of 270, had finally broken the poor old pedal, which is doing its best after all. When he got back home, if he got back home, none of that would matter though. Val would simply say, I told you not to go. She wouldn't say it in words at least not unless she was really angry. She probably wouldn't even give him a look that would communicate that sentiment, but it would be there in the air, or at least he would imagine it there. What difference did it make? Clearly, he shouldn't have gone biking today. Had he moaned? Yes, he'd moaned. A couple of times, he thought. And now he could hear the voices of the two ladies he had passed and said hello to just before the pedal had broken away. Let's see, one of them was a loon's foot cousin, he was pretty sure. Betty Mills, that seemed right. The other one was uh, Candy Kuyula from the beauty shop. His sister Jen knew both of them pretty well. Jen made it her business to know everybody pretty well. So by the time he got home, if he got home, now where did that keep coming from? Anyway, when he got home, Val would know all about it. Jen knew everybody and always knew everybody's business. No secrets in Hunter, or at least very few and none at all from Jen. So, inventory. He'd come down on his head. He knew that because there had been a hell of a pop, which he realized now had been his bike helmet breaking, not his head. At least he didn't think so. He'd have to get a new one, a helmet, not a head. They didn't make new heads, at least not wholly new. 
how much did they cost helmets? He didn't even want to speculate on what the other might cost in crash. And well, let's leave that alone. Anyway, he felt a little dazed, but his head did not hurt. His right shoulder must have been next to the pavement because he could feel a little pain there. Oh, and the right edge of his palm of his right hand hurt a good bit too. Some ribs on the right side were pretty sore and there seemed to be some scraping on the outside of his right knee. He opened his eyes for just a second. Yep, he was bleeding there a little. All that seemed pretty minor, though it would probably hurt like hell in the next couple of days. What though was this liquid all over his back? He reached around hoping his hand wouldn't come back red. He opened his eyes again for a moment. Oh good, just water. He landed on his water bottle. Oh God, they're not gonna stop, Betty Mills was yelling. What did that mean? Was there a car coming? He wasn't quite up to being concerned about this new development yet, but he opened his eyes and looked up into the faces of the two frantic ladies. What are we gonna do, Betty Mills said. Then he heard the brakes of a fairly large vehicle slowly being applied and a little squeak for a stop. That was good. Now another vehicle had pulled up over on the opposite side of the road. Dr. O'Brien, Candy Cuyo was saying, are you okay? I, yes, yes, I think so. He suddenly stood up. Betty Mills was sticking a cell phone in his face. Here, Doc, you can, you can call home or something. Uh, ben groggily pulled his bike up and off the road, picking up the broken pedal as he did so. There didn't seem to be much damage to the bike other than the pedal. It was a good old sturdy bike. They don't make them like that anymore. The truck that stopped just in front of him was driven by one of the shell drake girls. She looked a little scared and at a loss for how to behave when seeing an old man she knew lying as if dead in the road. Finally, she awkwardly smiled and waved at him as she now drove past. He waved back, attempted a smile of his own. The ladies were still talking to him and he'd missed most of what they'd said, something about using their cell phones to call someone, he thought. No, no, I've got a cell phone, I can just, he looked across the road. There was the wrecker from the Hunter Fix Hall and driving it was his old pal and nephew, Dale Sylvanus. This was true, true help. What you trying to do, Doc? Add to the body count? Well, Dale, Ben said and couldn't help smiling. You know, I've always done my best on that score. Thanks, ladies. I think Dale's got me covered. Sure you're all right, Candy Cuyula was saying again. Yup, just bumps and bruises. Thanks again. Well, okay, take care. The ladies walked off up the road, still talking. Cuyula was, uh, was about a three, Cuyula was about a three, uh, three minute walk from the spot where they stood now. Give them another two minutes to make the call or text. Nope, he'd never make it home before Jen knew. Pedal broke off, Dale, guess I, Better cut down on the pasta. Nah, Doc, Dale said, grinning from behind his, his neat red beard. Just faulty engineering. We can take care of that at the fix-all. I suppose, eh? Sure, might have to order a part, but no problem. Let's get you home. With one strong hand, Dale picked up the bike and set it down on the back of the wrecker. Ben absently tossed the pedal in behind it, walked around to the passenger side and got into the truck, still a little dazed. Was he really okay? He felt like he was, but some doubt lingered. Seriously, Doc, Dale said with a hint of concern in his eyes, you okay? Yeah, Ben said, here, here you are bailing me out of another scrape. Where'd you come from? The lake, car troubles? Oh, not much of a deal. Dead battery around in the bay. Illinois folks? Yep, Keegan's, ah. Think we'll beat the new news chain back to your house? Not a chance, Jen would tell Val. Then she'd tell his daughter, Kate. Then she'd call his son, Michael. But that boy would probably just text something back like, yeah, he does that. He was never sure if it, if it, if it was the Asperger's or just being a smart ass with that kid. Probably a little of both. Once Jen had told, uh, told uh, family about his accident, she'd start on Friends. The town would have him dead by the end of the day. Probably, what was the undertaker's name? Wait, Jesus. He'd known the guy since he was a kid. Getting old was hell. Yeah, old somebody. And the first name was Irish. What? Uh, it didn't matter. Didn't need him yet. He used the services before, though, too many times. But when you're in your 60s, there were bound to be some funeral arrangements for people you knew. But he'd only been 14 for dad, and then in his 40s for his first wife, Grace. Well, that was much too early. What was the undertaker's name? old, what was it? I had to stop this. 
it would come to him. So how are things in the Sylvanus family? Surviving and thriving, good to know. I don't need all the particulars like my sister. Okay, what was his sister's name? What's up, Doc? Dale shot him an only half amused look. That was practically a panic for Dale. Well, nothing, just a little fuzzy. Want to turn around, head down to the hospital? Well, hell no. Your call. His sister's name was, yep, Jen will have it all over town by the time you get home, Dale said, and gave him another look of veiled concern. A few minutes later, after Dale dropped Ben off at home, he could tell Jen had already called by the way Val wasn't looking at him when he walked through the doorway. Did you get eggs, she asked, as she put away a bowl in the kitchen. Uh, no, no, forgot that. I, uh, Val looked at him, smiled a little, and shook her head. Oh, so my sister called. What was his sister's name? Of course, she loves you all. Of course, she loves you almost as much as I do. You okay? Sure, bike's a little messed up. Yeah, broke the pedal, huh? He walked across the open living room of the rustic cottage camp, as they call cottages in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and gave his wife a kiss on the cheek, except he suddenly wasn't sure that's who he was kissing. She was his wife. Not his first wife. Oh, wait. Her name was... He walked out onto the porch and sat down heavily in the recliner near the window where all his books and unfinished poems were piled. At one point, there'd been papers of college students too, but that was long past now. In fact, his daughter, Kate, had his old position at Hunter Hills College in town. See, I can't, I can too remember things. What was the pretty woman's name in the kitchen? How exactly had they met? On a train. On a train to his brother's wedding. Wait. His brother couldn't be married. What was his name? What was his brother's name? He started out at the lake. He stared out at the lake. The sun was halfway up. So it was noon, clear day. Suddenly he felt somebody working on his right leg. It was this, this woman, Val, her name was Val. And she was wiping away blood from his knee. She was nice, nice Valerie. She said gently teasing, the only reason I mentioned the eggs is because I told you to get them three days ago, you silly goof. That's all I need from the store. Stupid to go in when you're riding there every day. Ben? And so that's the end of that chapter, a bit of a cliffhanger, um, if you're interested. And then this last chapter I'm going to read is from um, Young Hunter, and it is the story, a pretty typical story for a small town of a basketball game, and it's called Basket. The March blizzard had come in just as the game began at Darby Sheldrake Arena on the campus of Hunter Hills College. Buses and cars from across the UP had left other hometowns in sunny weather and headed here. It was a localized phenomenon, a finger of a lake effect swirl in off Lake Superior, 28 miles to the north. It had settled in over the Gros Rocher River Valley and seemed content to stay a while. Out at M28, just under 20 miles to the south, you could see the stars. On Tamarack Street, if you were standing across from the old Presbyterian Church, now the O'Brien Theater, home of the Hunter Shakespeare Company, you couldn't see the steeple. The nearby street light was a weird orb of illumination drowned by the horizon of swirling snow. Up in the woods to the north of the college, Above the hill were the ancient library, the Catholic Church of St. Anne's, the old class building, and the college president's house stood. The deer were huddled down. A bull moose raised his head from a hollow where he was sleeping, having heard a strange sound from below the hill, and a family of wolves huddled close in their den stirred at the sound as well. There were few lights on in the town, other than the doorways. A few old folks who weren't quite up to walking or driving to the college had tuned in the quarterfinal tournament game on the college radio station. This was the first truly significant tournament game the hunter gatherers had played in in over 30 years. With no possible foreknowledge that the gatherers would rouse themselves from a three decade sleep of mediocrity this year, the Michigan High School Athletic Association had scheduled the quarterfinal at the college arena. It was logical. The quarters always featured a team from the UP and one from downstate in the northern lower peninsula. And holding the game at the Sheldrake made logical sense. 
made logistical sense. The downstate team had groused a bit about the venue, but the MHSAA officials had pointed out that last year, the quarters had been held below the bridge. And in fact, six or seven years and 10, it was held below the bridge. The fact that the venue was in the hometown of the unexpectedly resurgent gatherers was mere coincidence. The Hunter fans were in uncharted waters. Everybody on the squad and even their coach, Dave Loonsfoot, was a virgin to such success. Rick Murray, their assistant coach, had been around when legendary head coach Darby Sheldrake had led the gatherers to a state title in two semifinal bursts in the 70s with Jake O'Brien starring on the team. And some of the white hairs now listening on the radio and not a few in the gym itself at the base of College Hill, in the center of the windswept and snow drifted campus had been there to see the last time too. And now it was late in the fourth quarter and the game was tight. The roar of the blizzard outside was inaudible inside the gym. Everything was inaudible inside the gym. There was a sound emanating from inside Sheldrake Arena that in fact was the sound of human voices, but it was devoid of words and had become a kind of animal excl exclamation of wonder and excitement and awe. Donnie Sylvanus couldn't hear it. He couldn't hear what his coach was saying either as he brought the ball up on the floor, up the floor. The crowd's frantic exclamation rose like a primal song as the seconds ticked down. Now just seven seconds from oblivion. Now six, the gatherers trailed 71-70. Since the first two minutes of the game, Donnie had been hounded by two, two much taller players of the opposition. The downstate squad had resorted to a 2-1-2 two, two, two chase defense. When the game started, they had come out in a man-to-man -man, and a smile had immediately crossed Donnie's face and the Hunter coach's faces too. In those opening moments of the game, Donnie had first taken the six foot three point guard of the opposition to the hole with a stutter step and then a lightning fast move through the lane where he scored and was fouled. He drained the free throw like he was in his backyard on a lonely summer Saturday. Then the next time down, he passed to his right and Howie Little Duck had taken the pass, then quickly passed back to Donnie as he whistled by on the right wing where Howie had set a pick on Donnie's man and Donnie had scored a nothing but net three. And the third time down, the opposing point guard who had been overconfident about playing these yokels from the UP had come out determined to cut all of Donnie's lanes. That smile of Donnie's, the grin of the hunter flash had crossed his lips again as he fainted right, then left and quickly dribbled a step back and drained another open three when his opponent sagged to cover a drive to the basket. The opposing coach had called a timeout then, and the new defense had been instituted. Donnie had still found a way to rack up 33 points, six rebounds, and 10 assists, and the gatherers had held that nine-point advantage established in those first two minutes throughout the night until the fourth quarter when Donnie had gotten into foul trouble, and Dave Loonsfoot, after a nod from Rick Murray, had sat the flash down for a few minutes. Disaster had struck quickly for poor Greg Madela, once the starter, who had come in to replace Donnie. Greg was good for Hunter, but he wasn't in the league with the opposing point guard who robbed him blind on three consecutive times up the floor and scored easy layups. The kid from downstate then scored at will on Greg twice more after a timeout. Donnie, four fouls in all, with six minutes remaining, had, had had to come back in. Donnie had ignited the offense again when he did so, but had been one point up, one point down, all down the stretch. At one point, Donnie had scored his 40th point of the night and a move down the lane, which resulted in a collision with the opposing point guard. The crowd had gasped, awaiting the referee's call. And when it came up as a blocking foul and not charging on Donnie, the crowd had gone wild yet again. When Howie Little Duck fouled out, Dave Loonsfoot had called Greg Madela, who had been sitting with a towel over his head since his humiliation back, in, back into the game at small forward. And now with time expiring, with the gatherers out of timeouts, Donnie charged the center of the defense, which collapsed on him, then fired an impossible pass over his shoulder to a wide open Madela on the right wing. The beauty of the moment was that Madela had no time to think, no time for ego, no time to worry. He simply launched a shot from the wing as he had thousands of times before in games of around the world and horse on concrete and wood on dirt since he was a little boy. For that one moment, the senior captain who had taken quite a hit to his image as star athlete when Donnie had replaced him at point guard, Greg Madela, who after all was only a boy, became fully that boy again, a boy playing a game. 
For a moment, all the pressure disappeared and this moment was just fun. This moment of local legendary fun would change this boy for the better forever. And that's that. Trying to, I try, I was trying to unmute there. Okay. Um, so um, uh, thank you. Um, I'm sort of, uh, I, you know me, BG, I, I have this affection for Ben. So um, I'm sort of, uh, uh, I know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm still in denial of it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions or, or comments for BG about uh, anything? I mean, I have a couple, but um, uh, so, well, I guess the, the, the main thing I want to ask so that people know, when is Old Hunter going to be out and where can they get it? Well, Old Hunter has taken about five hits from COVID so far. And we're still trying to figure that out. But our hope is that within the within a few weeks, I would say a month, it, it should be out and it should be available at both online at, um, at Snowbound and at Snyder's. Um, right. uh, so in the fairly, fairly soon is the, is the most the most specific I can be. But it's, again, yeah. you know, so so many things are unsure. Um, right. um, but uh, it's ready to go. Yeah. And, and um, I will, there will be a copy here at uh, Peter White for people to check out too. Um, so um, here's a question from Marty, who is not me, um, <laughs> but it says, the part about the doc losing his memory is so sad. Do you have personal experience with this? Um, well, actually, the, the, uh, the crash on the bike is... Um, almost exactly what actually happened to me. Mm. Um, um, and luckily it didn't, I did have a little bit of memory loss for just a day or so. Um, it was nothing, nothing major, but it very, it was very similar to what actually happens in the story. Mm. Um, and that isn't always the way with stuff that happens in these books. I mean, you know, any writer bases what he writes to some extent on something that he has experience of. But obviously, you know, I'm writing about things in, in parts of this book in 1832. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of invention uh, coming on here. But no, that uh, that was fairly, fairly close to what actually happened. And it is scary. Yeah. OK. Um, and um, well, I, I have a question about um, what care. I mean, maybe this is going to be an impossible question to answer. But, uh, you know, what character do you like? or do you see yourself in the most in, in the Hunter Lake series? Well, um, there, there's just, I, I can't even deny. I don't think, I don't think frankly that he's my favorite character, but the, the character of Ben O'Brien is, is based on me. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's just simply true. And, and it is also true to say that some traits of, 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 of Ben's brother, Jake, and Ben's sister Jen are based on people that I know or actually are related to or, or whatever. But again, what happens once, once it gets on paper um, is that things start to change, even if you had intended to make it um, just like yourself. Um, and interestingly, in the last book that's gonna come out next, um, next fall, I had some fun and, and the introduction to that book is actually an interview of, um, of Ben O'Brien by B.G. Bradley, so that wow. there's, so there's a kind of a give and take as to what's real and what is not. Um, oh. So you're getting sort of this like kind of metafictional thing going on. It's a little strange, yeah. And in <laughs> fact, and in fact, um, um, the the fellow who um, Matt Dreyer, uh, who we, we, you and I were discussing earlier, is actually a character in this book. Um, and actually comes into one scene um, near the end of the book, um, which I don't know how he feels about it, but I, I had a great time with it. <laughs> um, do, so um, do you, here's the thing, I mean, because you have a scope, it's like, um, it's five books now, it's going to be six books by the, fi the, the Hunter Lake Yeah, series. it will be six, and actually the last two books each have four novellas in them. So okay. it's really, it's really, you know, what how many is that I, i'm terrible at math okay so you've got 
four. This is the fifth book, which has four novellas. Which has in four in it. So there's that's okay. So that's nine. twelve books. There's twelve. So, books. yeah, that's that's kind of amazing. Um, so but, so do you did you have to like keep notes to make sure that you kept everything straight as to what what well, had gone on? I certainly I certainly do have all kinds of notes that I just type right in as I'm going along. Mm -hmm. um, but what what I find is that once I type them in, I don't really have to pay much attention to them. And then once I go back, um, um, you know, I, I see that, you know, it's all pretty consistent. Um, but if you were to ask me to, like, you know, make a flow chart or something or a, a genealogy of all of the characters, but that are by the end of this story and, and the relationships, I would have a hard time with that. <laughs> no question about it because it has gotten pretty pretty big by the end of this uh, yeah i well i can imagine because i mean you have a like a whole town full of characters right. that you're dealing with right and um for me it's like i i can't imagine i mean as a poet i mean i've written fiction and nonfiction too but as a poet i can't imagine trying to keep all of these lives clear yeah. and separate as well, to but, you know what's really funny though is at least this is my experience anyway. Once you create these characters, they're real. Mm -hmm. um, and so it isn't hard to keep track of them because you know them. I know that sounds really bizarre, but you, but you know them. So, yeah. you know, it's not surprising to you that so-and-so is somebody's cousin because you already knew that. You know them like you know people in your own town. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know that sounds really odd, but it's, it's actually how it works. Well, well, and here's my here's another question. And for that, along those lines, is did anything happen as you were writing this whole series that really surprised you? Oh, in almost every book, that that is the case. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, there there are times, there were times during the years when I was writing these that I would get to the end of the sentence and I would go, "What?" <laughs> I would literally be absolutely completely surprised by what had just happened. But then the, the funny thing that would happen is then I would go back in the writing that I'd done before then, and I would see that I had telegraphed this event for several chapters before this, mm -hmm. even though the event came as a surprise to me. So I don't know how that works. I don't know. And, and as I said in that previous incident, I don't know what the hell's going on in my head. I don't yeah. know. I don't know how that works. But I, but I know that there's a flow that you just have to get into and you have to allow the characters to talk and they'll tell you what's going on. Um, you know, yeah. So. It, well, it's, it's sort of like what I said in my introduction and which I admire about, about you is that you, you have to have this total trust in the writing process in order to be able to like accept stuff like that. Like your mind already knows what it's doing um, uh, and then your 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 conscious brain is sort of playing catch yeah. up. Yeah. When, when you do that. Not, well, I guess it's not unlike having a faith in a in a in a higher power mm -hmm. in some ways, because I mean that's and I uh, don't mean to get all all spiritual here, but I think that's kind of what is going on here mm -hmm. is that that a higher thing is happening that some higher part of mind or spirit or something <laughs> is driving the creative work. And I, I really think that's true for any kind of artist in any yeah. in any form. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just going to check it. Looks like I got another question here. Oh, uh, oh, that was this was just a follow up to about your whether um, the uh, memory loss and everything. She um, she said, oh, cla oh, OK, glad you didn't die. So, <laughs> you know, there you go. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's. Um, you know, I, I, I so admire that uh, anybody that's able to like sustain this kind of storyline over so many different books. I mean, there there's something as a poet, um, I don't completely understand how somebody can do that, you know, for that for that long. I mean, because like you said, it, or it, by the end of it, basically, it's like 13 13 or 14 separate books yeah. that you're dealing with, but you have the same characters, uh, you know, appearing in each. Right. Um, did, when you wrote, when you wrote the first book, Winter Heart, did you actually have this vision that it was going to be like no. this many books? No, not at all. Um, in fact, 
the original originally my idea for winter heart what i started with was it was going to be called seven walks on a frozen lake and mm -hmm. the only character in it was going to be ben o'brien was just going to be what was going on in this old guy's head um as he walked on the on a frozen lake and then i he was sitting and this is the first of those surprises i'm talking about and then he he was sitting um in by the fire in in the living room of his camp and his sister came in with cookies mm. and i'll be perfectly honest with you i didn't even know he had a sister at that point <laughs> so so then i mean really from that the whole town then developed i mean from his sister walking in with the cookies then the whole thing happened it was it just one thing led to another it was just okay well if he's got a sister does he have you know another family member and what were his parents like and there must be other people that live around him and pretty soon it was just it just well, and, and i remember that the reading the first book um when when his um well i don't know if this give i don't know if this is a spoiler or not but when his furnace explodes in yeah. that in that yeah. first book and then suddenly dale sylvanus is there yeah. um yeah. and and um suddenly dale sylvanus you know takes over in the second book right and it, right. it's all about him so um, the fact that you have that kind of um, that kind of discovery as you go along um, is is kind and of an that, and that really is what it is is discovery. It's not it's it's not creation in the purest sense because it's like I'm just well maybe that's what creation is. I don't know, but mm. but you know I'm working along and all of a sudden oh here's somebody else and here's this person and here's that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, well you know as a poet I I have to ask you this question so you know when you get in that mindset you know um is there a different way that you have to be in order to sit down and write you know like when you sit down in the morning because i know you work mostly early in the morning when you right. write yes um do you sit down and say okay i'm going to work on something uh, with fiction today or poetry today or i mean how how does that process work well for i i sometimes do that marty i sometimes mm -hmm. sit down i gotta get this chapter done today mm -hmm. and you know i never learn because it, as soon as that comes into my head there's almost no chance that that chapter is going to happen today almost, mm -hmm. none, almost none whatsoever so it really just has to, it, it, the best i can do is what I actually do before I sit, before I open the computer up or before I take a notepad out and start writing is I have a little sketch pad and I'm an absolutely horrible artist. I can't draw anything, but, but when I get up in the morning, I will just sketch something on the pad and I never know what it's going to be. Sometimes it's something out of a dream I had or whatever. And that just kind of, kind of opens me up and the drawings aren't the point. My God, if the drawings were the point, it would be really sad. Um, but 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 it kind of opens me up to whatever is going to happen, and then normally I can sit down um, and start to write. Um, okay. There. So that's usually the way it starts, and then you know um, you know uh, there's uh, a lot of times poetry. A lot of times is is uh, it, uh, happens to me as an offflowing of what I'm working on in prose, and sometimes in other ways I'll start to write a poem and I'll realize. Oh, this is a story of some kind and and that'll then take me back into uh into uh, uh, uh into uh, fiction again or into right. fiction you know. well it's sort of i mean because i know that you just uh embarked on a new project of writing um sort of a a, a, a science fiction novel yeah well you I, know i've written a lot of science fiction before and this is more fantasy than science fiction but i am Oh my God! You know, I I was I I got started on that, and then it came to a screeching halt, and then I got going on it again for five or six chapters, and then now it's at a screeching halt again, and something else has come out, which mm. is kind of a it's it's weird. It's kind of a um, uh, bogus uh, autobiography, and mm. I, where I give everybody a different name, but it's 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 kind of an autobiography and I'm also free to change things and, and move things mm -hmm. around. And that's kind of what I'm working on now. I don't know where either one of them is going to end up. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but that's, but, that's but, and I remember that I may correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of the, the germ and the germ of that uh, science fiction thing came from a poem that you it did. It did from, yeah. from one of your workshops. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It did. Yeah. So it, I, I mean, 
you know, people think, oh, you're a poet or, oh, you're a fiction writer or something like that. But I mean, to try to, to put that kind of, um, I don't know, that kind of box in a person is kind of uh, yeah, very artificial. I, and I, I think it is artificial. And I think even between, you know, even between writing and art and music and all, everything else, I mean, you yourself do all kinds of music. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and you've done theater. I mean, so it's, it's, you know, it's all just one thing really. And teaching too is wrapped up in there as well, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't really see much difference. I mean, I certainly many, many times when in 30 years in the classroom, I was acting up there. I mean, mm -hmm. some days I had to <laughs> because that's all you can do. Move that I, yeah. That I had to act. Yeah. 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 I, I've always told people that, you know, um, as, a, as a teacher, my, I mean, we have so much in common with what we've done, right. um, but right. as a teacher, um, so much of what you do is performance yes. um, because, because you have to keep attention, right? right. You have you've to got, do Yeah, you've got to do, and especially as a high school teacher, I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to do five to six shows every single day, <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're ready or not. And yeah. these are not short shows. These are these are forty-five to fifty minutes every mm -hmm. every day, five yeah. times, you know. Um, and you know you got to be able to be think on your feet. I mean, and that's what I when I was working with student teachers, that's what I would always tell them. And mm -hmm. they would have all these plans, and I'll say, okay, and what are you going to do when this doesn't work? <laughs> you know, they would just they would just look at me like, well, that's awful. And I said, no, because you know it may very well be that they'll all work, but you need to have something in your back pocket for when it doesn't or at least you need to be have to be able to think on your feet yeah and, and when if this thing is just not working you got to be able to go in a different direction and yeah. that is one of the hardest things yeah well and it, it's sort of something that um sort of translates into writing too i yes. mean you know you you think you have this plan you might have everything outlined in your head or on paper or sketched <laughs> out or something like that <laughs> And then what you end up with is, you know, it just doesn't work. And suddenly you're off in a totally different direction. Right. Yeah. Right. And sometimes, well, and I told you this story the other day. I mean, I had once had to throw away nine chapters, mm. um, not in this project, but in a, another one many years ago. And that's one of the hardest things I ever had to do. But I had to do it because what was going to come was going to come from right. <laughs> something I had just discovered, not from those nine chapters, you know, yeah. so... Yeah, and, and and sometimes it's a matter of you're so in love with what you've written, yeah, and it's absolutely the worst worst yes. stuff in the world. And yes. I, I used to tell student, have... student writers that all the time. I mean, if you if you come to a line that you think is absolutely brilliant, and you think it's the best thing you've ever written, chances are pretty good you better get rid of that as quickly <laughs> as you possibly but, can. But I don't know which writer it was that says you have to kill your darling. Kill your darling. Yeah, exactly yeah. what it is. You know. Yeah. Um, I, there's so many times where um, I've written a line in a poem that I thought was fantastic, you know, like this is killer, you know, and everything yeah. like that. Yeah. And then I've read it to one of my, uh, well, Beverly just showed up here and I've read it to Beverly and she was like, oh, Marty, you know, no, you need to get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, well, she said the same thing to me a lot of times too. Exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. it's just a matter of, yeah. you know, you fall in love with, when you find yourself falling in love with your writing, it's the time where you have to go in and go, we probably oh, yeah. need to and, think of something. And, and the reality too, is that a lot of times the thing that you, things that you think are just, you know, oh, that's pretty ordinary are actually something that's really coming out of what's really you, what your real talent is. Mm -hmm. and you don't even, most of us don't really recognize what we're really good at. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's just it. You know, no. I, I, I don't know if you've had this experience where you thought, oh, what I just wrote was absolute garbage. Yeah. yeah. And then you share it with somebody else. Someone Usually you share it with someone who you feel, you know, like uh, you really trust with something. <laughs> And you share it with them, and suddenly it's like, wow, that's amazing! I, yeah. you know, and that's and and you know that well, like you, like I started out saying. I mean, that's what I admire about you most as a writer is that you you have this absolute trust in the process of writing, and um, when yeah. you when you do that, you know, you have to be prepared for that kind of thing. And I I think a lot of that is is very practical. It just came out of seven years of working in newspapers. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you, I mean, you had a deadline at 9.15, you had a deadline at 10.15. Mm -hmm. And 
you had something had to come out. Right. And it was not going to be a lot of times Pulitzer Prize winning stuff. <laughs> you had right. to write it. You had to do the interview. You had to write the story. Yeah, uh, you have to take notes. You have to write the story and put it out in 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 uh, you know forty five right. minutes tops. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that kind of discipline helps, I think, in almost any other kind of writing. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I wrote anything particularly brilliant as a journalist, but it certainly set up uh, a, a pattern and a form that I could work from. That I I knew, you know, if I had to just plow through, I could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to write crap until you're not writing crap anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. And I, I, one last question, and I think this is a good one to remind people of at the end of the reading, um, is uh, Cece just asked, could you please remind us of the names of the Hunter Lake books in the order that they Okay, came yes. Um, okay, let's see if I can get this right. Okay, mm-hmm. Winter Heart, Summer Rounds, Fall Back, um, uh, Tales from the Sugar Shack, and now Old Hunter, and the last one is go, gonna is tentatively uh, titled uh, The Seasons of Hunter, uh, and that'll be out, I hope, next fall. Okay, uh, all right, so there you go. Um, we got all, and all those books, except for the new one that we're still waiting to come out, um, Old Hunter, um, it, are available here at Peter White, and also, if you wanna purchase them, they're at um, Snowbound Books, and um, I, you can also, I think, get them from uh, Amazon if you want, but I uh, will encourage you to support local bookstores. Uh, it's, it's Snyder's as well. Snyder's has them as well. Okay, Snyder's as well. So, yeah, uh, you know, support the local bookstores, support the local uh, stores that you have here as opposed to um, paying Jeff Bezos um, yeah. more money. So I, that he I couldn't agree more. Guy. I couldn't agree more. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Well, I want to thank you, BG, and uh, I want to thank everybody that showed up tonight. Um, as always, I, I I just love hearing you read, BG, and um, and uh, it's just been uh, really wonderful. And um, you know, come fall when that next book comes out, we'll have you back so that we can find out, even though it's going to kill me, what happens to Ben O'Brien. <laughs> Um, and uh, find out what happens to all the other people in Hunter that we've come to know and love over these last, uh, these, these books. So thank you, BG. Thank you very much, Marty. It's been, it's been wonderful as always. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, BG.